Pickup refers to the honest to goodness last process that a framer has to go through in framing a house. It is going over the whole structure on the inside with a fine tooth comb to make sure that everything is ready to cover it up with sheetrock. The first thing I look for when I get right down to the pickup part of the process is whether or not the walls are flat. I do that with my eight foot level and I roll along down about knee height, checking to see if everything is within about an eighth of an inch of being in line. I come back up to about waist height, making sure that everything is pretty much in line. And then I do the same thing up high. If I come to a stud, or in this case a post, that's too far out on my side, I got a power plane, and I plane it down. If the stud is bowed the other way a little bit, I have cardboard shims that I staple up to fill the void. The intention is to get the wall more or less in a plane. And like I said, plus or minus an eighth of an inch is generally okay. The second thing that I'm watching for is blocking. Now the blocking is put in as the framing happens, but on pickup you're looking for that odd piece that was either forgotten or knocked out or damaged by a plumber or an electrician that needs to be repaired. There's two kinds of blocking in this wall. This is backing blocking. It's put in here so that a banister, a railing, can be screwed to this wall any place I want. Daniel did it a long time ago. This is fire blocking. Can you see that it stops any fire that might happen up here from getting under the stairs or any fire that might happen under the stairs from getting up here? There's a big hole knocked out of this one for the gas line, but I'm going to stuff that with fiberglass when the insulators are here. So blocking happens in various places for various reasons and at pickup time you've got one last shot to get it right. So this house has got a lot of blocks of both kinds. There's 184 different fire blocks in this house. That's like a lot, right? And I don't know how many backing blocks there is, and I'm going to put some more in today because you need a back piece of backing, ideally, at each side of the windows for curtain rod backing. You need it behind towel bars. You need it behind grab rails. You need it behind, ideally, if you've got a door stop, it's good to have that on a piece of backing. So all of those occur at different heights in different rooms for different reasons. You gotta kind of keep that in your head as you're working your way through the house because there's nothing worse than coming up to put a, a 36 inch towel bar or a grab bar in a room where you just really got it and man, there's nothing to screw to except to put some mollies in the drywall or a toggle boat bolt and you and I both know that that is a lame sauce way to attach anything to a structure. But you've got a chance at pickup to make sure there's something back there. The third thing that is typically taken care of at this phase is drywall backing, both at the ceilings and on the walls. So I've got two different cases here on this west wall of the house that are worth mentioning. There's a ton of backing here. I mean, there's a lot of wood that was put in here because of a hold down in the corner and where this wall comes out. And yes, that's full of insulation back there. But see, the, the sheetrock is well backed up in this corner. Now down on the other end, it's a different story. See this? The drywall on this wall has got backing clear into the corner. But on this wall, we couldn't really get a block in there without making it impossible around that hold down and it just didn't make sense. So I made the decision to let the drywall float almost two inches on this wall. I can stick with that decision. The drywall will be fine. It'll come together. It's not an outside corner. It doesn't have to be nailed exactly in the corner. So that's going to work. But I am going to need to plane down that stud because it's a little proud and is going to tip that out. In fact, when the drywaller comes through here, if I don't get to mention it then, he will hang this wall first and then that wall to capture that unsupported corner and hold it back. So it's always a question about how far you can float and how close it needs to be. In a ceiling with 5 8 drywall, 
the end of a board will float like up to seven inches. Like you see that right there? There's no ceiling backing in that corner, but it's only five inches from the edge of the joist to the edge of the wall, so five-eighths rock will float that distance. Any more than five or six or seven inches, though, it's got to have backing. A power plane and an eight-foot level are pretty much mandatory for pickup work like this. In fact, I don't think it could be done without a power plane. Now, sure, a nice straight board or maybe a plywood rip with a factory edge would get the straight edge piece of the work done, but an eight-foot level is certainly the way to go. In fact, now that I think about all of this, I didn't even own a power plane until I started doing pickup work. And that was the moment, probably sometime around 1991 or so, where I went ahead and spent the money and added one to my toolbox. And I have found plenty of other uses for it over the years besides just straightening studs. Now a word of warning, you got to keep your eyes open for staples and especially for toenails that are sticking out in the path of the planer. When, and not if, you clip a nail, it's going to knock a nice chip out of the blades and the progress really slows down. The reason this pickup phase matters, and the reason you ought to set aside some time to do it, is because just covering these discrepancies in wall flatness with drywall will not make them go away. Bulges and dips and highs and lows will always be visible, especially in a ceiling. More important than that, however, has to do with installing the cabinets and doors and trim and tile and countertops that are going to be coming next. Any deviation in the flatness of the studs is going to transfer through and complicate the next trade's work. So this is the time to fix it once and for all. So on this little short wall, I have one stud that's back a quarter of an inch, which could be shimmed out on this side but I don't want to have to plane a quarter of an inch off that side. So in this case, it makes sense, in my opinion, to notch this and put a stiffener across here. I've got a short piece of two by four. I throw it up here and scribe the length. Then I set my saw to an inch and a half deep and lock it. Then I come to about the midpoint, which I think is probably this spike knot. There's a spike knot here, which has shrunk. Pull that thing back. I'm going to cut that out. And I'm going to make the top of the cut first. And then I drop down and put the table at that cut, because I know the table is three and a half inches away from the blade. And then since it's a knot, I put a plunger. using the inch and a half distance from this side of the table to the blade. And I pull out the chunk, there's a little piece there. Take my handy dandy chisel, since I was afraid to overcut on the camera. So I bring this out to where it flushes on this edge and the other edge and shoot it. Same thing. Then pull the bow out. Like that. And check it. Nearly perfect. I got half of it. I'm going to get a little more. Why am I running a screw in? Beautiful. In addition to planing and shimming, you can 
cut in a strong back or a stiffener into the wall. Or you can sister, it's called, you can sister a fresh stud right alongside a crooked stud to straighten it. You just cripple the crooked stud with a cut and then lay the straight one alongside, nail them up, and bingo, it's straight. You can also use screws and nails and wood shims and plywood and pretty much everything on the job or at the lumber yard is at your disposal for this process. The goal simply being to get a job ready for the drywall. Keep an eye out for any pipes or wires that are unprotected by nail plates and maybe snap a picture or two of the main plumbing and electrical locations just in case you need to locate something later. And in general, just remember that yours are the last set of eyes to see everything that's behind the finished surface. So if you're on the ball, you may catch a mistake that somebody else made that has nothing to do with framing at all, but would be really nice to have fixed before anything needs to be torn out. Pickup, overall, is pretty nice work for several reasons. It's light work, all the heavy lifting's done. You're inside, it's not windy, it's not rainy, if it's summertime, you're in the shade, and so that's a plus, right? You're often working by yourself because the trades are done and you're, you've, you're the last guy in there before the drywall shows up. So there are several reasons to think that a job as a pickup carpenter on a housing tract is a pretty good job. One of the real benefits of being a pickup carpenter is you get a real global understanding of how a house is built. And you get an up close and personal look at the difference between using good material and bad material and following a good framer or a lousy framer. And then you can make your own determination about how you're gonna fly when you become the framer and what kind of lumber you're gonna buy when it's your project. But there's a world of difference between using kiln dried studs, kiln dried lumber and green lumber. And there's a world of difference between following a butcher and following a carpenter. We have the advantage today of doing pickup work on our own project, and so I have no one to blame but myself. But in general, we are just about ready to insulate this thing, hang some drywall, and make it look like a house. If you wanna hear some more about pickup, doing pickup like two houses a day, every day for six months, on a Dell Webb tract in Las Vegas, tune into our podcast, I'll be talking about that. It was interesting for about the first 60 days, and then it became a little bit repetitive. But in any case, thank you for watching Essential Craftsman, and keep up the good work.